welcome back to paradise. Anyway, yes, we're going to continue discussing the Lord of the Flies. All right, wait, Nate, be honest. How many other browser tabs do you have open right now? What's, what's, what else is going on on your computer? Are you really, I don't know. All right, pay attention. Um, really excited about the, uh, the fish that uh, Matt caught last time, and uh, the sandcastles are looking good. I think you could probably do a little bit better, but we'll see. Anyway, today we're going to look at some of the things that we just read about in chapters 8 and 9, talking about the Lord of the Flies and murder. Let's have a look. A number of scholars who study literature, psychology, sociology, and history have described this concept that they call the other. And it has to do with how people construct a sense of themselves. So you could talk about yourself and say, well, I'm unique because, and then you could list specific features about yourself. Things like your physical appearance, your likes, your dislikes, your unique experiences, or you could think about yourself in terms of what you are not. So you could say, I am not, and then list things that apply to other people or other groups. And people have suggested that this sense of creating an other to create a sense of who you are by contrast is a powerful and pervasive feature that shapes a lot of human behavior. You can think of other as a personal construction, maybe even beginning when you're very young, especially if you have siblings. And so you can say, well, I'm the one who does not have green as his or her favorite color. I'm the one who did not get in trouble for X, Y, and Z. And you can start to think of yourself as the opposite or the anti-force to one of your siblings. And then you can grow up and think of yourself as not and then fill in whatever blank. Now this can be applied in a group sense, and this is where a lot of people study it. So a community can gain its sense of identity by pointing out who they are not. And they constantly reflect on things about others or groups or individuals who they consider to be other as a way of keeping them focused and bonded together so that they cherish what they have in common and get even more strength by disdaining what they are not. This can often take the form of religious prejudice. I am not a Roman Catholic, or I am not a Protestant, or I am not Muslim. It can take the form of a racial prejudice. So I am not like this or that racial group, or even a political sense. I am not a fascist. I am not a communist. I am not a capitalist. And so, and, and so on, as many different features that you can imagine, you can think of somebody else as the other. Sometimes it can just be basic moral categories. I am not a liar. I am not an adulterer. I am not, I am not. So creating uh, a sense of the other. Now, one of the things that people look at is how leaders can bind groups together by leveraging the power of the other. And sometimes what happens, or at least what has been described, is that a group might not really be suffering from the presence of a harmful outside force or other, but the leader would like to identify someone or some group as an other so that they can get unity within their community and focus on fighting a common enemy. One of the uh, scholars describing the Nazis in the rise of uh, their power in the 1930s and 1940s, looked at how the Nazi party identified Jews as the great enemy and how anti-Semitism was a central rallying cry for the Nazi party in Germany. And that really wasn't reflecting any real threat that the Jews posed to Germans. But it has been said that if the Jews hadn't existed, the Nazis would have had to have invented them because they were so useful to the Nazis as an identifiable common enemy that could bind the German people together in a common hatred. And so we see in The Lord of the Flies 
that this sort of thing can somewhat happen. And one of the problems can come when groups need to find this other. And if we see at the beginning, the other that they are worried about is the beast. But the beast is hard to pin down. It's hard to determine who, what, or where the beast is. And so there's a growing need that we can see for an other to be identified in a specific form. And as we see at the end of chapter 9, Simon stumbles back into the camp and is immediately identified as the beast, and then the boys unite in tearing him apart, and he dies. So we can think about this idea of the other. In what ways do we identify ourselves in terms of the other? Well, I don't know who I am other than to say I am not that. Is this a good thing? Are there bad things about it? You can kind of consider. In chapter 8, we meet the Lord of the Flies in one of the most disturbing and bizarre scenes in this book. So you can uh, think how, how you understood this scene. Uh, in the book we're using, it's on page 143, Simon is off by himself and he sees the head of the pig on a stake set up kind of as an offering to the beast and he begins to have this sort of hallucination episode. We know already that Simon has some sort of a mental issue or a neurological issue where he can kind of go into spasms and it seems like in, it, in this passage it, it describes him realizing that one of his times is coming on and he hears the voice of the beast now, uh, we may have talked about this earlier, but Lord of the Flies is the English translation of the Hebrew word Beelzebub. Beelzebub is a term often used to describe the devil. Uh, it, it originally comes from some of the Canaanite gods, um, Beel, like Baal, Lord, uh, and, it, and it means in, the, in those languages, Lord of the Flies. So it's kind of got this really dark sense about it. And on page 143, Simon is looking at the Lord of the Flies, and it says, I am the beast. And Simon seems to be interested in running away, and the beast says, okay, go down to where the other boys are. You'll only meet me down there, so don't try to escape. In the conversation, the beast also talks about his disdain that you could kill the beast. So the boys have seen the beast as an external threat, a serious one, but something that is out there somewhere and they should hunt it. The beast says, fancy thinking the beast was something you could hunt and kill, right? Because he's saying, I'm part of you. I'm inside you. And at the end of this chapter, the beast describes how he's going to kill Simon. And we see that Simon is killed brutally by the rest of the boys as soon as he goes back. And he's carrying the information with him that what they thought was the beast, the parachute man, is really nothing but, as we now know, a corpse attached to a parachute. A rational explanation for that phenomenon. But in this case, the beast within destroys Simon's message. Simon is turned into what we described before, the other, identified as the beast, and gives the boys an opportunity to feel like they have an effective response to the fear that dominates a lot of their energy. And this is one of the factors that seems to come into play as groups bond. Not only do they need a sense of an enemy or an other, the other needs to be within reach and at least somewhat vulnerable to their power. So to conceive of an enemy or an other who is out of reach or invulnerable doesn't do much good. People want to follow leaders or be part of groups that can hurt the enemy and can bring it down in some sense and unify behind that. How powerful is our motivation to belong to something? This is a dynamic we can see 
in the scene in chapter 9 where we have the kids dancing around in the fire, Jack had issued an invitation to the boys to join his tribe and have fun. And on page 152, we see that Piggy and Ralph, who have stood up against Jack and really don't believe in what he's doing, as they see the fire, it says that Piggy and Ralph, under the threat of the sky, find, found themselves eager to take a place in this demented but partly secure society. They were glad to touch the brown backs of the fence that hemmed in the terror and made it governable. Kill the beast, cut its throat, spill his blood. So they join in the dance, just like all the other kids, out of this fear of being outside in a space where terror is not controlled. And somehow, even though these boys don't really have significant power over their environment, and certainly not against the beast, and particularly if the beast turns out to be something within everybody, not an external threat, and yet they feel much better. So how often have you done something as a way to remain a member in a group? And maybe it's the case that you have done these, the things you've done to stay in a group were also the right thing to do for other reasons, but what, what level of motivation does that belonging need play in our decisions? And of course we see the chant, kill the beast, cut his throat, spill his blood, or bash her in. A lot of times I uh, think that the chanting and the dancing in this scene is very similar to what I see in our own pep rallies here at BCCS. And it actually does kind of give us that sense of the other. So how, does our, how do our sports teams build a sense of unity and focus? By demonizing the opposing team. How much does music and dance also abil uh, create an ability in us to override rational consideration? It is said that Plato, the Greek philosopher, wanted to ban music and poetry because he felt that it caused people to act irrationally. He said that the beat of drums allows soldiers to overcome their fear of death and march blindly into battle. And so it is here, to what extent does the dancing, the music, the rhythm allow boys to commit murder, essentially, knowingly, without feeling any regret? In the next chapter, Piggy and Ralph kind of reflect back on what had happened, and they actually try to avoid admitting even to themselves what they had done. But it's interesting to see just how easily it happened, and at the uh, end of chapter 9, we see the really sad image of Simon's body being taken back into the sea as, it's, as it drifts away off the beach, all as a consequence of this belonging dance that the boys do around the fire. I don't know. Reading about this part always kind of makes me hungry for some pork barbecue. I don't know if you're feeling that way. Um, I could do some ribs right now, definitely. Anyway, your assignment after watching this video is to write a little bit of a reflection about how you feel motivated to do things. So to what extent do you do the things you do because you're convinced regardless of whatever other people are doing, you're just convinced that it's the right thing to do? Or really is what motivates you to act in the ways you do have a lot more to do with, well, you don't want to be cut out of a group. You want to fit in. And maybe that's a good thing because if the group wants you to do good things and it's effectively motivating you to do good things, it's kind of a win-win. But what do you think? Do you think you actually do what you do as a result of desiring to belong or do you do it just because you think it's the right thing to do? And is this a good reason or a bad reason to do things? We'll see what you think in your reflections. Anyway, I think you guys should uh, go and invent some really thrilling tribal dances for a while now. Let me know what you come up with.